All right, hi everybody. So we're here with Yannick Guizdala, the one and only, uh, all the way out in California while we're out here in, in New York under lockdown. Mm -hmm. And so uh, definitely trying to make the best of it. But uh, I think one, of, and I'm sure you could agree with this, Yannick, um, one of the things that makes this go a lot easier is just connecting with people. And so- sure. I was just having a conversation with a friend of mine in Germany on video chat thing is saying like, what would this be like in total, total isolation? I mean, we all say isolation, but yeah. we can just pick up the phone and be in contact with anyone in the world. I was FaceTime with a friend in New Zealand yesterday, Germany today. It could be a lot worse. And I'm trying to look <laughs> at it like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, certainly. And I, and I think that, um, you know, especially considering that, you know, musicians are of course home and um, it's a really cool opportunity to connect with a lot of musicians that people just didn't have access to. I know even for myself, a lot of my personal heroes between putting live videos up on Instagram and being able to interact with them, you know, it's like trying to catch them at the end of the gig before they slip away to the green room. Right. You know? um, hey, I'm, I'm cool. a pro at that. Like, <laughs> Go talk to me. Bye bye. See ya. This was it. <laughs> Well, we caught you, and so you're stuck with us. <laughs> Easy catch, man. I'm, I'm right here in my studio, day in and day out right now. <laughs> so, Yannick, I mean, definitely one of the things we wanted to talk with you about, um, and I feel like you're such a great resource for this, is, you know, what do players do with this downtime? Um, you have so much material available when it comes to practice routines and, and, uh, and just what players should be doing to improve their um, – their entire musicality, not just technique, but just the whole scope of them. Um, but for those that might not necessarily be familiar with your work or haven't yet dived into some of your um, materials, can give us three to four great places to start, even before you start looking at sheet music or anything like that. But just what is the uh, what's the posture that players should be getting into? Well, you've already, kind of you've already answered the question before I even had a chance to speak. And this is from, I got this sentiment from uh, Derek Sivers, who was the founder of CD Baby, is a, a blogger, a, a activist. He's an online guru kind of guy. He started CD Baby in his bedroom in Portland, Oregon, I believe, literally taking CDs from artists, mailing them up and sending them out to the customers and losing money for years and years until he eventually sold his business for, I think, $22 million some years ago. So talk about a quick success story right there, quick in terms of me relating it, not quick in terms of the time it took him. But his whole mantra is just start. It's exactly what he did. He didn't think and plan and all oh, what if this and what if that. He just started and he learned as he went. So my, my, my thing always with practice is just start, especially if this period of like downtime from working is new for you and you're not a consistent practicer. You're not like, I'm crazy. Let's put that out there right away. I'm on the psychotic end of the spectrum. <laughs> because I'm 41 years old, I've been playing the bass for 26 years, and I will still gladly, happily beg for the day to have enough time where I can put in five or six hours every single day right now. So we're talking about someone who is, in me, who is very much on one kind of extreme. There are more hours in the day, but at this point in your life, to put in five or six hours is kind of extreme in terms of practice. But if this is a new thing to you, just start. It's literally 10 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day. You surely have it right now. Mm -hmm. There's no excuse. <laughs> yeah, if there's any time for no excuse, it's now. If you come out yeah. of this social distancing isolation thing without being able to play at least five of the things you've been thinking about in the last two years, you really were not giving the day enough credit mm -hmm. uh, for how much time there is. So. Uh, you know, a thing I'm often asked is, how do you structure your routine? What does a typical practice routine look like to you? It, it doesn't. There is no such thing as typical. There is such a thing as doing exactly what I'm about to do right now for everyone watching in the video, is pick up a bass, is put it on my knee, and play a couple of notes and see how it feels. If it feels great, I'm already at a good starting point of perhaps not needing to spend a long time warming up, you know, it's all about paying attention to the immediate feedback of what your body gives you. So, so when you say feels great, 
Well, unpack that a little bit for us, because I, I know from us, you know, talking personally, um, feel is always a big, important part of um, and, and the touch, you know, when it comes to your uh, to your instrument, that's that that's always something you're you're constantly refining. Uh, unpack sure. that a little bit for us. What is tone? Well, what's feel? So I when when I pick up the instrument, I get a sense of brittle or not brittle. It's a very personal sensation, and that's how I feel the strings and the instrument, the temperature of the room, the temperature of my hands. And if everything's warm and loose and smooth, like those kind of rounded feelings, it's so weird describing feelings with words and shapes and sounds with words because it's all so personal. But as it relates to my personal experience with this, if it's more brittle and cold and tight and, mm -hmm. oh, you know, like I, I picture like steel girders and grayness <laughs> and, you know, just yeah, not yeah. pleasant things to be attracted to. Sure. You know, I don't picture the sun or like a floaty in the swimming pool and a margarita. You know, if I'm on so that not, end of the... not this. Definitely not that. No. <laughs> Anyone watching online will see the sun rising behind Jordan. Yeah, no. <laughs> if I'm feeling that, then it's a great starting point because I know I'm already like five steps into the process and I don't have to start at literally one note, repeated quarter notes at 60 BPM just to get blood flowing. Now, check this out. It's right here on my desk. I will pull the camera down just a touch. Great warm up. This, this is, you know, I'm a drummer before I'm a, a bass player. The drums are my first wow. instrument. So I have a practice pad here. You can just about see that in the shot. You're sure as hell going to hear it in the microphone, unfortunately. Just basic technique, trying to be light, trying to be in control, and just that action of, of, of drumsticks. It, it, it's maybe counterintuitive as a bass player, but these simple things that drummers do to warm up, awesome for yeah. bass players. Pair of drumsticks, practice pad or a pillow, really good way to go. It's just getting the blood flowing into the hands and getting that warm feeling as opposed to that brittle feeling. Gotcha. That's what I'm talking about when I'm so, you know, feel. So uh, uh, the phrase feel and tone usually mm -hmm. kind of come together in the same sentence. Do you, do you even like the word tone? You know, we, I think as bass players, we're sort of inundated with videos that say, you know, discovering your tone, your tone, your tone, your tone. But what, how do you respond to something like that? First of all, I think that's maybe a guitar player's word. I, don't, I still don't think it actually makes any sense for a guitar player either because I think sound is a far better word for that. Again, it's just a personal thing. <clears throat> We're talking about describing uh, uh, sonic landscapes with words. I think this is a dumb pursuit. First of all, like how do you describe the characteristics of an octave pedal? Oh, is it crunchy here? Is it round there? I, you know, crunchy and round could be the polar opposites for you that they are for me. So mm -hmm. uh, here I am, son of a linguist. Uh, <laughs> you know, eh, I know when to pick my battles and when not to when it comes to describing things with words. But I think sound is probably the, the much better word. It, it is for me anyway. And it's the mm -hmm. thing that when I listen to one note, before we even get to time, because I think time and sound, you said feel mm -hmm. and tone or whatever, I think time and sound are the two words I use the most, are the two things I think about the most, they're the two things I work on the most. And before we get to the time, because time has to have rhythm, so more than one note, when I hear one note of John Coltrane, before he goes to the next one, I know it's Coltrane, one note of Mike Stern, one note of Jacob Astoria. So the sound thing is... 50% I'm trying to get on the screen here is is <laughs> gee, I'm I'm whatever you know it's it's half of it then yeah. you get to the next note and the feel and the time and all that stuff that's the other thing those are the two things I'm concentrating on the most when I sit down mm -hmm. to practice and what I'm most conscious of so uh, let's uh let me ask you about Coltrane what okay what describe Coltrane's sound and what you love about that sound it's it's emotional on so many levels. And look, forget about Coltrane and his sound first. Let's talk about when your mom calls you, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Not only in one yeah. word can you tell that it's your mother, mm -hmm. you can also tell what kind of mood she's in. Yeah. Right? And whether this is going to be a good or a bad conversation, whether you're about to have a good day or a bad day, mm -hmm. reprimanded or loved, you can tell all those things in one word. So when you when I when I associate the time and sound to voice and to something we all know 
Like nobody's tone deaf. Like we all know that completely naturally because we're immersed in it the whole time. Then we can start to unpack what Coltrane means because then you have something to relate it to. You know what I mean? You say, oh, so Coltrane, and it means something different to everyone. Mm -hmm. And the periods of Coltrane's life where he's playing, yeah, or bebop stuff and lines and then walls of sound and then modal and who he had in the band surrounding him and complimented by Eric Dolphy here and Lee Morgan, you know, all the components. So with Coltrane sound, it, like anyone whose music I love, it pushes me and moves me somehow. I was today interviewing one of my favorite drummers in the world, Benny Greb uh, yeah. from Germany. Fantastic. And his sound, just his floor tom sound pushes me across the stage. That I, I don't care what comes next or before or in th- I, that alone means I'll travel to the ends of the earth to make music with that guy. Yes. That is how important sound is. You know, you work for Aguilar, you're surrounded by the production of sound and tone day in and day out. You know, yeah. like it, it's so interesting too. Uh, it, it, coming to like our side of the fence, you know, when people hear, um, you know, uh, amps and cabinets in combination, you know, of course, like some of the first clips are, what, what is this warm and is this bright? Is this, and, and, and I always love, especially when artists come to the loft and we were able to go through everything and sound is so much more personal and nuanced than I think people give credit to. Big and time. so, you know, I've had a lot of people come in and, and they love actually how everything sounds, but you know, there's, there's something that emotionally connects with them. So, you know, especially with like the cabinets, you know, the SLs and the DBs, two sure. different flavors. No one is right for every person. Yep. Um, but I, I, I always end up leading with the question, what, what when you plug into feels at home? Right. What's good, you know, what is, what, what is the speaker cabinet that does that? And so I think it's the same thing. I mean, I feel with drummers I mean, my, you know, if we're going to talk about drummers who I think are a great example of sound, you know, Steve Jordan, Steve Jordan's snare sound across Ridiculous. any kit that he put, you know, Steve Jordan, the second yeah. you hear that crack, yep, boom, it's him. And it Absolutely. feels good. And you just want to play bass with it. Yeah. Nate Smith is another one. Another yeah, player. yeah. And that, that is what makes them who they are and what makes us talk about them and why Steve Jordan and, and Nate Smith are the two first people you mention when it comes to sound. Yeah. You know, uh, Benny Greff said an interesting thing today. He's like something along the lines of, uh, oh, I really want to get this right. It was just about if your time and your sound are together, um, you won't have to explain that to anyone. People will ask you about it. You know, mm-hmm. because it's so strong. It's like such a part of your voice. And going back to the amp thing with people coming in and trying amps, I'm always of the, of the mindset of, okay, where do I hear my sound? And then how close is what's coming out of that speaker, what I heard, mm-hmm. you know, preconceived beforehand. That's how I arrived yeah. at the 12-inch cabinets, mm-hmm. the Tone Hammer 500. It was, that was my, I found my combination. Yeah. And that's always what I'm looking for. You know, yeah. and, and when that changes room to room, stage to stage, band to band, studio, uh, small club, big stadium, like, and you have to adjust and, and, you know, dial in your range, but still have that nucleus, that foundation of what is your natural sound, literally unplugged sound of the instrument and the fingers and the wood. Yeah, I think it's like, uh, I mean, to take it out of music, it's, it's that worn in pair of jeans. Oh, you yeah. Know? The, right, the worst them. feeling is uh, jeans that are just not comfortable, but worn in jeans are like, there's no better feeling. You want to be in them all day. So yeah. how does time now bridge into this? Well, don't suck at it because I won't be listening to you very long if you do. No, I mean, no, that's, it is my biggest like peeve when I listen to music. And it's the thing that immediately jumps out along with the sound, of course, that I'm like, oh, I'm I'm really attracted to this. Like this is something I can get inside of and want to hear more of. And the time, well, it's about experience, I think, at the end of the day. You know, how wide and how broad and how long is your experience of hearing different time or feeling different time and of playing different time and then being in complete control as I am with you in the pace of this conversation. If I started to talk like this, you would press the button to hang up. uh, How boring is that? You know, like it's so it's about range to me and the 
great like let's talk about drummers because i love drummers let's talk about quest love and talk about sound yeah. and where to put the beat and steve jordan where to put the beat as well you know like a keith richard's song is like super different from like a john mayer trio song or you know uh any number of like blues records he's played on and punk stuff like he really has the range of motion like yeah. here's the beat and he can play right in the center and in front and behind and make them all feel good yeah you know? that's a so great way I, of doing it yeah i think that's what i'm thinking about with time you know and of course yeah. the process of getting that to, to that and and that feeling of relaxation is surrounding yourself with people who are way better at it than you mm. you know and whose people's time and feel that you like and you're attracted to and emot is motivating to make you work harder on it, you know? Yeah. And I think, you know, too, uh, finding people whose time and, and the, the sound of their time, because that's, you're right. I, I like the whole front because uh, a quarter note is not a, oh, there's, no, there's no, a, it's there's so a front wide. End. And I, it was from, I think, I, actually, if I remember correctly, I think it was from one of Steve Jordan's instructional videos from from a while back he okay. said you know the quarter note it's got a front and a back to it it's still mm. a quarter note well there you go yeah <laughs> where we're lining up on that could mean the difference between uh reggae and and being like being on top of the beat is not necessarily a bad thing if right feeling you know right and so how how is a as a bass player now where so we've been talking about drummers, but what, in your experience, what, what's the relationship as a bass player, you know, to a drummer who has the ability to dance around it? Do you find, like with Benny Graham and people like that, that it inspires you to play with time differently? Or oh, yeah. do you find yourself being able to, like, trying to be the, the pillar in the band? I think we all first of all i think everyone in the band has to be equally responsible for the time that is not the drummer's job that's not the bass player's job it's not the monitor guy's job i think everyone has got to be responsible and then when you operate from that you know point of honesty and and point of like you know do you have the chops to be that responsible for the time you know like let's see what level you're operating on when you do like with benny greb's trio for instance when we're in that situation all three of us have fantastic time. Not only do we have fantastic time, but we all agree on like, uh, that like we immediately agree, even though it changes from song to song, sometimes from section to section, we all have an agreement on how wide that quarter note is. Mm. And we expand and contract that accordingly. Um, and I think it's the ability to adapt and to be flexible in the moment, truly improvising. And we could be playing a Toto song. Not that we ever would, but we could be playing a Toto song and still improvising. D despite the fact we're playing the exact notes of the album of Toto, we could still be improvising by expanding and contracting the size of the quarter note and where we agree on what that is and what that framework is just for the, just for the time feel. So, yeah. And we've, well, so you and I have talked about this a little bit in the past, but you know, what the, the balance of, your practice routine mm. contributing to this, uh, you know, developing and this being done in community with other musicians and then listening. You've talked about all three sort of being in connection with each other. Um, how, you know, how does, some, okay, we've talked about time, sound. How does this now come back to when I'm in my chair, in my living room, I'm picking up my bass? What are some of the things that I should be mindful of or tools that help that i think uh really important not to overplay and i'm talking about the velocity with which especially if you practice quietly if you're in an apartment situation which i was for most of my adult life until very recently living having the luxury of living in a house i can play a little louder not overpowering uh, the situation from an acoustic standpoint on the instrument, you know, not trying to push too hard because you know that if you crank that amp and you're playing that hard, it's just going to distort and fart and not be your sound at all. So really playing for the level of where you're practicing on the, uh, on the flip side of that, every single time I leave town and go on the road, it's two or three shows before I feel comfortable on a tour and it just every single time highlights the importance of playing live and playing with other people because you just cannot get it done at home. This is something I'm 
not flexible on with my opinion at all. Like you can debate me until the cows come home, but I know from personal experience, you cannot replicate the communication, the, the air moving, the amount of people to interact with the inspiration. You can't replicate that on your own. I'm, you know, I'm the big fan of the loop pedal. I'm the big fan of, you know, making play along tracks and jamming along with it. I do it in my videos all the time, but it's no substitute Mm. for actually getting out there and doing it. And that's where it really happens. Like if you listen to Pat Metheny interviews, the common thread for 30, 40 years or whatever has, and you know, people say, Hey, how are you this consistent? How do you have this sound? How do you, have you accomplished all this? One of the biggest underlying factors is that he says, well, I've been able to do it on stage Mm. every night for 40 years. Like that is the key. And this is the extreme. We're talking about an extreme, like 200 plus shows every year for 40 years. Yeah. Holy cow. The Eagles haven't done that. Like, you know, they're, like Tom Petty hasn't done that. I mean, Pat's crazy, but there's something to be said for being on stage. And I would say my goal is to play maybe 60 to 80 shows a year eventually as a band leader. And I think that's, that would be a healthy balance between working on stuff conceptually at home and then actually putting it into practice live. And what about the listening experience? Like how should players, um, you know, who are home now that are getting a little bit more time, you know, to, to be with their instrument, how should they be listening to music when it comes to their practice? Uninterrupted. So not, would you, would you say it should be a listening experience first and then grabbing your bass? Uh, Oh Yeah. For sure. I mean, like my thing has always been because until this point, there has been no pandemic in my lifetime. So I've always been on the move in 20 different places at the same time. So yeah, my listing process for the most part has been completely interrupted because it's a four bar phrase. I'm like, okay, I got the four bar phrase. Let's grab the instrument. Let's figure out what that was because I didn't understand it right away. Now we have nothing but time. And I think when this is all over and it will be over when it's all over, I think we should also try and dedicate more time to uninterrupted listening. You know, imagine the concept of listening to an album from start to finish as the artist or producer intended it in that running order. Imagine that as a concept, you know, how 1962 of us, like that is a such a, that's over, that's finished, that's gone. I don't know why I bother making a playlist for an album anymore because nobody's going to listen to it in one go. So, Mm. And, yeah. and also on the, on the sorry to interrupt no, but on, no, the, no. On, the, on the flip side of that, like people are producing music differently as well because of that, you know? So in some instances, maybe it actually doesn't care because no thought did go into the playlist. But mm. if I'm talking about like listening to Miles Davis kind of blue, mm. start to finish, no interruptions, like no phone, no doing the dishes, no loading the dishwasher, walking the dog, nothing, just, you know, 42 mm. minutes of uninterrupted listening and see what you get out of it and really get immersed in it. I think that's where you get value from. So as an artist though, if you can let us into a little bit of what some of the the creative process is for you, because you've, you're an interesting, um, you know, person I think who's been so hip to the digital side of the MI world for so long. I mean, I feel like a lot of people now, you know, because of the situation are, you know, I mean, gosh, when you open up Instagram, right? How many live streams, uh, they're going on, no, but I can't know, even you know, start a live stream. And it's so crowded, you know, <laughs> like, but like how, how do you find yourself writing in this era as someone who loves listening to the whole album? Do you, do you want to put out singles? Does that not even, um, is that not even something you want to approach or is it still, do you still have album mentality when you're writing? I definitely have album mentality, even though I don't always write the entire body of material for that album in one distinct period. Um, I would say my last record, The Union, uh, which we tracked last year in June, that was absolutely written in one go for the for the album in a quite a short space of time, maybe except one song. But the bulk of it was that was really album mentality. And look what it did. Nothing. You know what I mean? Like really in the grand scheme of things, it was just a, to my ear and to my musical sensibility was just a beautiful collection of music that I wanted to put together and have one of my heroes in John Patitucci produce the album, you know? So that was what that was. My next project, if, if I can get it together, will be a trio with Tim Miller and Brian Blade. Cause I think they have two of the most symphonic sounds uh, of any musician I've ever heard. So yeah, 
I'm not making albums for commercial value. I'm not making albums for spins, plays, streams, downloads, follows, financial gain, none of it. So my, I have the luxury of being, having an album mentality, I would say, you know, and, and so oh, go on, yeah. I'm, I'm just not forced yeah, to do yeah, anything yeah. except what I want in, in that sense. I, I guess it's interesting because right to an extent, no one is at this point. It could put out a single if they wanted to. No one is forced, but plenty of people believe they are. And plenty of people try to conform and try to think, oh, there's a formula and I should be in this box. And this is the thing that will bring me success. You know, I think so can, a lot of people like that. Yeah, I definitely. I can agree. I mean, so keeping on the thread of albums, what's Yannick spinning these days? Oh, geez. Uh, um, I've been asked this question a lot in the last few months, so I feel I've overused this album, but really I'm still, I haven't even really dug as deep into it as I can, even though I think I'm at least 150 plays into it, complete from start to finish. It's by Shy Maestro. It's called Dream Thief, and it's on ECM Records. And I just think the way Manfred Eicher records pianos and just records albums in general is insane. So it's another thing about listening. I'm not just listening to the music. I'm listening to the production value and the techniques. And now we're afforded this kind of behind the scenes look. Sometimes on YouTube, there's a little 60 second clip of those guys in the studio making that album. So then I see the mic placements and then I go back and listen and I listen, close my eyes and listen to the room and picture the room and picture where the mics. I'm like, just assimilating so much information. It's not just about, oh, they played C major there, and oh, that's a nice triton sub. You know, <laughs> pr pretty, you know, and the older I get, I wouldn't have been doing that when I was 19. I was just like, man, he he's burning, you know? <laughs> Definitely a slightly, hopefully a little more mature take on it. But yeah, a lot of classical music. I'm listening to a lot of Elgar, mm -hmm. some cello stuff, mm -hmm. some uh, Arvo Part, who's his Finnish composer. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so where do you, do you find yourself? Because uh, I just, you know, saw uh, your interview with John Davis, which uh, folks, oh, yeah. if you haven't seen it, go watch it. Oh, Another cool. fellow Aguilar guy and, and uh, an amazing person. An I just one of my artist. favorite bass players in the world. man. And, and he's worked on seven of my solo albums. So that's like my engineer for almost my whole recording career, which is crazy. And he has a, such a great perspective being a bassist and engineer, which is yeah. a unique gift set. And so... I guess, do you find yourself listening to records um, with a more of an engineering or a, or a mixing mentality? Like, is that? I wish I could. Like, I wish I could listen and be like, oh yeah, they use the blah, 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 radio, blah, 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 this thing and that compressor. And, and oh, that's, that sounds like a Neve pre or whatever. I don't have that skill set. Um, I do it from a bigger picture, low skill level uh, aspect. I absolutely do. And I make notes and references. And even though we talked a little bit yesterday, me and John about like, do you reference certain other albums when you're mixing a project? And he's like, well, not really, unless it's a very specific relationship between two instruments. I do make little notes about, oh, I like the space that that piano is in, or I like the delay reverb combination that's on this vocal. So I have a library of notes and kind of journaling on stuff that I listen to for future reference because I hear it in the orchestration of my own music and I want more options. Uh, you know, I think the mixing console as an artist, as a recording artist, should absolutely be one of my instruments and I should know way more about it than I do. I start to understand compression now and EQ and signal chain and gain structure and, and a few things, but I can't tell you the class of preamp or what it means or solid state versus tubes. I couldn't give you a dissertation on it. I know little bits of it. I think I should be way more versed in it as a recording artist. So that is something I'm thinking about. And is that, um, are, are you, are you taking that skill set though and, and, um, refining it more to still chip away at Yannick's sound? Like how does Yannick describe Yannick's sound? What do you- uh, uh, It's uh, crap. That's how I describe <laughs> it. Uh, dude, I, can't, I know that sounds so stupid when it's something I do all day, every day and have done for 26 years. I honestly still think it's crap. That is, please people listening, that is no reflection on any piece of gear that I use. That is a pure self-loathing neurotic, uh, issue that I should probably be in therapy for. And I'm not, not joking at all. I mean, really like 
take this for instance, John is a world-class mixing engineer and has mixed so many of my records and I've had so many kind things said about them and I am just over the moon with, with, the, with the overall sound of the music. I hate my bass sound, you know, and, and the way it's recorded and it's getting closer. It's not as bad as it was in the beginning and every time we do a record, I learn something more. What I am aware of is that I should just keep my mouth shut and keep working on it. It's not something I complain about outwardly. You know, if you ask me the question, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, but it's definitely something I'm probably more conscious of than anything else. And was when, when this thing was very real, this, this isolation shutdown thing, it was the first thing I wrote down on my to-do list was fix your effing sound. Like that was the first thing I, I I don't have the piece of paper. It's in my little notebook upstairs, but mm. that was the first thing I wrote down. Like, you have time to do this. Start working on it even more. Um, I'm experimenting now with compression, with that exotic EP booster, with the dip switches on the, for the tape, uh, the Echoplex mm -hmm. preamp. I know the pedal you guys just put out. I'm super interested to, what is that called? The DB925. DB925, super psyched to listen to that. I'm really like investigating stuff like that. Because I want to walk into the studio and know when I'm walking out of the studio, I'm 100% happy with it. Of course, we'll never be 100% happy, but I want to be closer than I am now. And I guess the more sensible answer to your question is that it's more about the organic sound of the instrument and my fingers than yeah. it is anything else. And when I start there, and then I enhance it with pieces with an amp, with a preamp, with whatever in the chain, that's probably the sensible way to go. And that's what I'm working on right now. Yeah, I agree. I'd like that you said it that way because I, I, I would agree. I think in starting, it starts with us, the source, and the source being right, and then yeah. these other things that... Um, the issue is it. when the brain gets in the middle of it all and you start thinking and then it's all out the window. You know, it's another 50 years of, of anguish. Got <laughs> so, uh, you know, kind of come back to the practice routine. What are some mm. of the... Let's, let's talk about some of the pitfalls that you mm. that that exists when it comes to practicing what are if you can throw out a, some some quick fire be mindful of this because I, I know for myself the biggest problem with practicing uh is that i need a i need a gut check when i'm mm -hmm. practicing who's how am i going to keep myself in check to not practice the wrong things maybe but i don't know you, what do you what okay do you think? so first thing is you got to record yourself when you practice Ooh. It's so easy to just let stuff skate by in the moment and tell yourself that it was much better than it was. But you have to have the same criticism of yourself that you do when you listen to a Steely Dan record or something. You're like, oh, I love that. And then when you listen to some other record that you hate and you say, I hate that, you have to have those same honest, I think you do, the same honest criticisms of yourself. And that's how you improve by hearing it it's that immediate feedback. It's like a comedian who doesn't get the laugh. The comedian tells the joke, the room's silent. The comedian tells the joke, the room boos. Yeah. This is good indication that you're probably telling the wrong joke, you know? And when the room laughs, oh, there's something there. You know, I follow comedians. That's my favorite medium to follow because they, it's so brutal. You know, they get the feedback every four seconds on stage for an hour if they're headlining. Oh, yeah. Come on, man. At least I got like seven to nine minutes before I get any feedback on it. And then yeah, it was like, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. it's now time to applaud. Like it's very defined moments and you, it's sort of expected of an audience, even if they're not into it. So mm -hmm. can you really have that much of a bad night as a musician? You sure as hell can as a comedian. Mm. You can have a bad 10 seconds for an hour every 10 seconds it's brutal so um yeah i'm looking for that immediate feedback the recording the listening back and just coming from a place of honesty mm. i think is really important and that honesty uh do do you find yourself um having more growth moments of that when you're on stage um or when you're in the practice room normally when i'm in the hotel afterwards listening back because I, I film every show and then i watch every show afterwards wow yeah uh, i mean that's okay okay no not, that's a, not a hundred percent not a hundred percent but i i would say like 90 percent of the time yeah i'll sacrifice an hour of sleep and at least skim the show and go back to bits where i was like oh did we turn the beat over there or mm. oh what was that sound i randomly got to i want to make a note of that and like clip out the clip and put it in a folder of stuff like go back and investigate that so i'm pretty 
crazy. I got that from Dave Weckl. Dave Weckl had the video camera next to the drum. He's measuring the angle of the sticks in the hotel afterwards. Wow. Like I do like crazy, you know, practice regime type stuff. And there's something to be said for that. It all depends on your goals. How good do you want to be? How much pain are you willing to put yourself through to get there? You know, Usain Bolt, fastest man on earth. He didn't get it by like hanging out Burger King and drinking a, a, a milkshake every day. He put himself through hell. You know, drummers whose hands bleed because they spend so long in the practice room. That's what Jojo Mayer is telling me stories of when he was a kid. Just, oh yeah, it was 14 hours and I looked down. I didn't have a red snare drum head and like this blood dripping from his hands. You know, it's all perspective. Or do you want to learn how to play Katy Perry's new song? In which case, probably don't need to let your hands bleed. <laughs> Unless you want to play it with Katy Perry. Then you've got 15 years of nonsense to go through to get to that point. Yeah. And probably still not worth it in the end. Wow. It's, yeah. uh, so let's, let's talk about your favorite thing. And by the way, the pedal studio, holy smokes. Great episode opening. Oh, that, thanks, man. That uh, animation at the beginning, so cool. Season opener. We, we, we went strong. Now the pressure is on to like keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, what have I done? I'll give myself yet another full-time job yeah. producing a TV show once a week. Pretty cool. I, I'm loving it, though. This, That's fantastic. This thing is a beast as well, this synth pedal. Unbelievable. That's great. Yeah. So like, what, what, tell, tell us about the pitfalls there because... I mean, pedals are just, there's such a wild world out there, but how they become, um, like we've been talking about, something that enhances the source. Yeah. What do you got to keep in mind when you start bringing that into to a gig? Or So I'm a huge fan of, uh, and I'm going to butcher his last name, Chris Lord Algae, or, mm -hmm. you know, the, the mixing yeah. engineer, like Muse and... Uh, Kelly Clarkson, he's mixed major, major records. I've been watching a lot of videos of him when he goes to the console and he takes out like a guitar track, and he grabs the EQ and he spikes the mid range like to 100%. And you're like, oh, God, it sounds horrible. And then he dials it back. And when he's dialed it back and found the soft, the, the sweet spot, it's like, wow and it might even have been a db and a half away from where he started out but it was like a complete transformation and enhanced the sound that's what i like to do with pedals i like to see what the extreme of the pedal is then how i can dial that back to something that's functional and also not functional i like the weirdness you know it's 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 also a balance you know in 2017 i did maybe 80 or 90 solo concerts it was called the last minute world tour mm -hmm. i went solo around the world playing solo bass concerts and i got to some weirdness i got to some weird sounds every night and i was all about just opening something up and going with it and smashing it through a reverb and a delay and looping it and sampling that's not great if you're in a band you know it's like you show up with a pedal board as a bass player in a band and everyone looks at you like, oh no, how, how long is this guy going to be here? You know, so it's really being aware of your surroundings. And I, I'm, I'm now, like I was saying a little bit before, I'm so into the presence of the clean sound. And I say clean in inverted commas because there are a few things in there, little light compression, little preamp, uh, the EQ and the amp, of course. Maybe I'm using the Noble for recording sometimes. Maybe I'm using the Tone Hammer pedal sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm really interested in the integrity of the natural bass sound. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I'm working on right now. And everything else is just a little flavor and it's very, very personal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know? That's awesome. It's, it, it's true. I think there's a, you know, there, with effect pedals, you're right. There is sometimes the extreme where it's, it's musical. And I think, you know, how, how we work to keep it musical is so, is so important. Right. Um, if not, it's just, it can be noise. You know. And it can be a total rabbit hole and a trap because like, I really want to use the Maris Otto Bit Jr. <laughs> I think it is ridiculously plush in certain areas and the randomness and the, how, how am, I, am I really going to use that? Am I really going to have another MIDI switcher on the board to control one pedal on a completely other different routing and blah, blah, blah. It's, mm. Some of these things become hobby projects at home, perhaps for recording more than live. I definitely want to make the differentiation between a live rig that works with a little uh, loop system in it so I can switch in a pedal du jour perhaps so, so mm -hmm. I can add something, but something that's like, that's it. It's mm -hmm. set. 
and then have other stuff that I experiment with and like get into my, you know, crazy the wall. Yeah. The wall, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the wall. And I love the shelves. <laughs> the wall, yeah. But, but so now how does, how has that been inspiring your writing these days? Do, well, do pedals you... push the way you play, you know, you know, I like this pedal is set in 20 different ways could make me play in 20 different ways. And so I, I am trying not to write from the bass. I'm trying to write from the ear more than anything, not even the piano, like just really? having, yeah, just singing the melodies. It's something I was conscious of like early on first record mystery to me, 2004. Mm -hmm. We did that. It's like 16, geez, 16 years ago. I was really conscious of not writing from the bass to make it not be a bass record. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like you hear bass records and it's like the slap thing or the super unison line thing or, or the, the real generic things that bass players have. They have their favorite weapon and they want to use it all the time. And then that, mm -hmm. when that gets into the writing process, that's a little, I think that's when you start to become a little dishonest, not just with yourself, but with your audience. You mm -hmm. know? Well, let's talk, let's talk about some of your albums because, you know, you just said something uh, that I think, um, well, I've been thinking about, which is uh, songs and albums that um, don't have some of those qualities, but are just m musically, they're just there. And your album, The Space In Between, uh, oh. from 2010, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, a, an album with a lot of space, uh, particularly the song uh, Next, which... Oh, yeah. um, Man, tell us a little bit about that because that is a good chunk of time of not much happening. But <laughs> I mean, you listen to it. I don't smoke weed. I don't do any drugs or anything. I'm like the most straight-laced guy. But you listen to that and you think, oh, was Jerry Garcia producing this record? Like, mm. you know, like it's a little little spaced out and smoked out. But next, I mean, that's I'm, – I'm, let me see here. Let me pull it up. Eight minutes and 31 seconds. First of all, what was I thinking? Eight minutes and 31 seconds. Unbelievable. I'm making albums that long right now. You know what I mean? Like, um, but yeah, it was, that record kind of came together out of a main session, a main tracking session in Brooklyn at the original Bunker Studios in the basement. Oh, uh, cool. uh, so John did that. That was the first record we worked on of mine together. Um, and it was Jojo. Tim Miller, myself, and Mike Stern tracking live in the studio that day. And then I added a bunch of stuff. The trumpet you hear on next. So mm -hmm. check this out. I don't know if I've ever talked about this. Now I'm questioning whether I should. Okay, no, I will. I will. Um, <laughs> the trumpet on next is a take from a completely different song. Wow. That is in B flat major. And next is in A, A. So not, wow. they're a half step apart and they're from completely different songs. And because the trumpet was recorded remotely, I had complete isolation because I was just getting the trumpet files from my buddy Odin in Spain. So yeah, when you listen to the really out stuff, I'm not trying to out him as, oh, well, he didn't really play hip on it. Like it was just the way I heard it, putting it together. Like one of those, it was one of the first time actually I was doing it because this is my second, no, this is my third album. It was the first time I was doing anything where I put it together after the fact. Mm. Mystery to me was recorded live in one take in front of a studio audience um, in 2004. And live at the 55 bar was, although we did four sets, we used a complete set. Uh, to make that album. So this was the first time I was kind of piecing things together and I just heard it. I was like, wow, this is mm. some different shit and let's try. And it, it worked out, you know, with this beat, with this qualifies uh, as an album or, and even this song next as uh, to what you've been sharing with us, you know, writing music from hearing sound as opposed oh, to a hundred percent. Yeah. You know, I, it was very orchestrated and arranged in the previous two records because they were horns. It was large ensemble. It was like eight piece and seven piece bands, the first two albums. And then this had a bunch of people on it. Mike Stern, Ayeto, James Valentine, Doug Womble. So that's four people plus the rhythm section of three people. So it had still seven people, but very orchestrated. Like Carrot Juice, for instance, is just me and Ayeto. Just me and Ayeto, I think. Just a duo. So yeah, very different ranges in the album and definitely from a hearing standpoint, you know, like looking at all the pieces and kind of putting them together. 
And also, I mean, I, you, you cover twice, which is one of, you know, my favorite songs oh, yeah. from Little Dragon, you know, so uh, tell us a little bit about that, you know, how, uh, as, so, as an artist, you know, covering it, I mean, cover records, of course, are, are a big thing. Well, I was but, on you know, the tour with them for a couple, it. I was in, on tour with them for a couple of months. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, not in their band, I was, we okay. were on the same bill, it was a co-headline bill with an artist called V.V. Brown, who I was the yeah. musical director yeah. for on Capitol Records. So that was early 2010. And we did a co-headline thing with Little Dragon. And I actually got to play trumpet with them every night on this wow. one song, like they would have some of us from the band up and play. It was uh, super, yeah. and they were just amazing musicians. Um, uh, Hockey and Eric and uh, Fred and Yukimi, just incredible musicians and a great band. And that was kind of in their early stages. That was their, maybe their first or second album, I think, and they weren't blowing up. And then the next year it was like, <laughs> they went into the stratosphere. So I kind of caught them on the up tick like that year was really big yeah. for them and i just heard this song every night twice and i was like this is pretty freaking amazing yeah. i'm never gonna sing it but my buddy doug is an awesome singer mm -hmm. let's get him him on this and it, it it worked out great and it was before robert glasper covered it and then 50 other people <laughs> yeah i always like to put that in there <laughs> no it's and it's such a great song i think to cover uh what another fellow Aguilar guy uh, rich brown you know up in canada oh, yeah. did a, a great solo piece that you can see on our youtube page um okay super beautiful it's a great song to hear people blow over sure. um because it uh and especially rich brown i think he's a good example of that it's just his phrasing it's it's these simple songs to me one chord man <laughs> so let, let's talk about that uh, you know uh, when you're when you're f writing phrases or when you're uh, soloing and improvising you know you because you're someone who's got such a, a depth of vocabulary how do you what do you find yourself doing to turn all that knowledge now into what Yannick wants to say let's say on a solo it's repetition. I mean, it's it's exactly the same as we all started out. Google, get 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 that the mama. We started out like that, not really being able to communicate, and then we were so immersed in it, and we did it every day from our parents, from our siblings, from our schoolmates, university friends, or whatever, adult friends that it's so natural. And I think that gets lost a little bit when it comes to improvisation with music. In, it's such a cliche sounding thing to say that, oh, well, music's just a language, but don't like, give, give that phrase its credit because it really is. And when you start to think about it that way, you have to really start to think about the way you would truly learn to be fluent in another language. And the questions like, hey, do you have any tips on improvising? Do you have any tips on this? Do you have a hack? Do you have the one scale that works over 20 chords? So, actually, no, I don't. I have, if you truly want to improvise, I have 20 years of hard work to build a foundation and, and then another 40 years of maybe being successful 50% of the time, 40% of the time when you actually do it live. The reality is far more brutal than I think the average person who's asking that question about how do I improvise really understands. Um, so there's no one thing. There's no, the only two things I'm ever, and I try not to be conscious of anything when I play because I'm looking for that flow state. I'm looking to be in the zone and have no distractions. The only two things I will ever really be conscious of is rep, are, are repetition and change. So when you when say I, repetition, what do you mean by that? So when I'm improvising, if I have an idea, okay, so now I'm thinking that's enough of repetition. Now I need to change. Mm -hmm. And now already that's too much change. So I need to find mm -hmm. something in that language. And you know, and develop a, a new idea. So it's a constant changing of repetition and change and motivic development and being able to, of course, have the vocabulary, the fluidity and the flexibility to do that through chord changes, to do that modally, to do that free on the form, to do that time, no changes, so many different frameworks that you can put that ability to improvise into, you know? Do you, uh, I don't know uh, how to necessarily ask this, but are you someone that actually enjoys improvising? Oh yeah. Are, I, but I guess I guess the reason why I ask that is 
Because, um, hang on, hang ahead. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very important because improvising is not the ability to play great on giant steps. Talk about it. Talk improvising, about it. like, because so, so let's, yeah. let's make the differentiation between, like, do you enjoy improvising? Yes, I enjoy improvising. Do you enjoy playing over complex changes? Not particularly. Not that I can't do it, but also kind of pointless most of the time unless there's a concept, rhythmic or, or melodic or harmonic. Mm -hmm. So I think you can be improvising in the most simple form on one chord uh, playing funk music and you can truly be improvising, mm. you know, and, and most people aren't, I would mm. say like, uh, but when you, when you do have that ability, that fluidity, that flexibility to just go anywhere, I think, yes, improvising is for me the most fun I'm having when I'm restricted and when the shackles are on and I got to play this song, not that that's a bad thing sometimes, that comes down on the list of priorities. Yeah. You know? My it's own it. songs, I literally just, oh, I don't like that chord anymore. Let's take that out. <laughs> uh, let's never play that B section again. And live on the show, we'll play the melody once and never come back to it. You know, I'm just like, yeah, let's get away from that. Let's find out what's new. I want to see what's new. I don't want to hear what I've already done before. That yeah. to me is done. It's boring. It's finished. It's over. Mm. It's great. You know, if I, and I've seen you perform and, and, and of course all the clips, you know, you're someone that I, I, I get the impression that loves both camps because you look like you're having the time of your life playing pocket behind someone. Oh, yes. And then, and then when you do get to come out to the forefront, you equally love it. Um, right. But I don't differentiate between baseline and solo accompanying or leading when it comes to improvisation. Tell us a little bit about that. Stepping out front is not improvising. Stepping out front is just stepping out front. If you're crap at improvising, it's just going to be just as crap as when you were standing in the back. So you've you got to have that skill set to truly improvise and interact and communicate with everyone around you. It can be one sixteenth note just added to a groove and that's improvising. And it was a reaction to a little splash symbol hit or something, you know, that that's the fun, you know, with Benny Greb's band, I actually not a fan of playing like melodies, like high melodies and distinct solos. I like the improvising within the confines of the rhythm section and playing low and playing with the pedals and the synths and all kinds of stuff, you know, so I think just stepping out front and playing a solo, not necessarily improvising. Mm. Yeah. And so, so how do like, because that also uh, I feel like could be dangerous to tell someone <laughs> when you're playing pocket, you know, you're improvising. But how do you how do you bring that world of of uh, being a foundational you know musician, but also uh, speaking and saying what you want to say in that role? Uh, by playing along to Michelle and Degacello records for a decade. Uh, yeah. I, I, like plantation lullabies is what did it for me with the groove, you know, digging you like an old soul record, uh, boyfriend, like those kind of tracks, just the ability to go back to that. And um, she is just a ridiculously great bass player. Like if I had to make a top five list of all time bass players, she would, uh, no way she would not be on it. It has to be there. One of my biggest influences as a bass player and just the ability to have that foundation and that sound in my ear, like that jazz bass thick in the pocket locked in with Gene Lake or Jojo or whoever the drummer was in the band at the time, Sean Rickman, any of those guys, just that in the background means, okay, I can just hit, I can hit the eject button and go back to that and get out of my own way immediately. So having that kind of fundamental foundational element of your playing, super important, whether that's from Bootsy Collins with James, uh, with James Brown, or whether that's like James Jameson with any Motown record, whatever your foundation is, have that to go back to, and you'll generally find you won't get in the way of what's going on in the band. Yeah. And really just little bits, just like put your toe in the water here and there, you're gonna build experience over time. It's all about experience. You can't yeah. get that on YouTube can't get that you can't buy that it's not in a book you know look at me i'm a you i'm a book salesman essentially and i'm telling you it's not in a book um so go out and get on stage and do it do it that way that's yeah and she's definitely someone guys you should uh try and see her live i remember last time oh, i saw yeah. her was at new blue um and what was so fun to watch her um play pocket but um, the joy, she would, she, I remember she tucked herself behind the amp. She didn't want to be seen. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. But you could hear in her playing oh. how in tune she was to every little nuance and just 100%. smiling, grin to grin. And I was there with my wife and to see uh, my wife um, just dancing, to hear music where you just have to move. And she's another one. And I want to hear your thoughts, but her time is It's huge. unbelievable. I, I attribute anything I do in time, I pretty much attribute to her, you know? because I just have that implanted in my brain. I thank my buddy Jeff Gascoigne, great bass player in the UK, who told me about those records super early on. He also told me about like Art Pepper Meets the Rhythm Section and you went short to speak no evil, but he's like, man, you should really check out that shit too because that's really the foundation. And, and it was Plantation Lullabies and Peace Beyond Passion, those first two records. And then Bitter, that was a little different trajectory. But yeah, and just watching her live and then seeing her play a little synth bass or keyboards or whatever yeah. it is, the, just the feel and what she exudes is super positive, musically speaking. Sometimes she has yeah. some edgy opinions and political views and very kind of racy songs that she writes and sings, but what's coming out musically, uh, regardless of your political stance is just undeniably positive, I think. Yeah. And, and imagine that. What a concept. Dancing to music. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and you're right. I do have, I get great joy from playing in the pocket and playing groove. And that is where it doesn't make it up to YouTube from gigs very much because people want the flashy stuff. But that is where I find, you know, 80% of my career not that people mm. really know about that. Like the behind the scenes, playing on records, being a musician, being a bass player, super yeah. important. We uh, so, should watch our time here because we only have three minutes before yeah. the hour. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're, we're keeping an eye. We've uh, got Zoom, uh, who yeah. is uh, pretty much the worldwide provider right now. Of yeah, right. Um, I guess be before we go uh, yes. and wrap up, the, the, the wonderful Chelsea Guizdala. Oh, yeah. Come on. I'm her biggest fan. I mean, <laughs> she's destroying it. I mean, and like just crushing it the last six months working with Kanye West, uh, yeah. playing on the new Beyonce record, playing with Beyonce live, doing the Kobe Bryant tribute. I mean, just insane levels of, of stuff. I am like, just wake up proud every day, you know, and I, I get stuff from her from the way she plays upright bass. Uh, the way she can not touch the instrument for a month and then go play beautifully in tune with a section like she's doing it all day every day it's insane and she I mean, sings in tune she knows like 800 standards to all the words wow. and can sing them in any key i mean the if if you guys follow at chelsea on bass um if you want to check her out and we have a podcast called two bass hit it's at two bass dot hit on instagram you can follow us there i'm at yannick wizdala so I'm, I'm always champion championing her there you go jesus vocabulary's going uh every day so you can you can check that out and uh give her a follow She's what's, a bad, what's what's the i guess the biggest thing from her whether that be musical or or in life that you say okay i I'm, i gotta go after that she inspires me there I mean, I know she inspires it's 20, me. It's, it's, tw it's 2020 and she's still trying to be a musician. I think that's inspiring in itself. And not only is she trying to do it, she's doing it as a woman in a male dominated world and is being super successful, takes no shit from anyone and really stands up for herself. And it's not about male, female. And it's about, she's a great musician and, uh, and has a, a ton of other skill sets of graphic design and copyright, uh, you know, music copying and all this orchestration, and all this other stuff that barely even get to the forefront. And I think that is a super powerful thing to have. Mm. And uh, yeah, I'm very, very proud of her. I'm very inspired by her every day. And as an upright player, how do you, how do you take some of the, um, how do you take some of that upright world that's around you now and and does that come over to your electric side does it inspire what you do do you hear tone time and sound differently? i hear all of those things i love her time and her sound i'm just scared of the instrument and uh yeah i i i let i leave i leave it to her like at her wedding out her wedding at our wedding she said that if she was her dad said actually in his speech that it was like great that we kind of both do the same thing, but at the same time, we do completely different things as bass players. So there's no competition. I think that is what keeps us healthy, keeps us inspiring each other and makes it like 
great fun to be around, you know? Yeah. Yannick, tell, for, uh, for people that don't know, where, what can, where can they find you? Uh, yep. How can they get some of your, your practicing resources? Tell us. Physical books are on Amazon. They ship worldwide within a day or so. You can go to my store, store.yannickwizdala.com for all the books, the videos, yannickspacestudio.com. Uh, follow me on Instagram at yannickwizdala and check out the YouTube channel. So many shows and episodes every week. Um, yeah, it's all there. Awesome. Well, Yannick, right, thank you so much for taking the time with us. We made yeah, the time mark. Cool. Love you, brother. And best right, of dude. you out there in LA, all right? All right. Thank you, man. Have a good one.